afternoon. It's my great pleasure to introduce uh, today Professor Carl Hobart from the Boston uh, University Global Literacy Institute. Uh, he will be talking to us today about Middle East conflict, who's Jerusalem, as an illustration of a method that he has pioneered and um, implemented in K through 12 schools all across Massachusetts and elsewhere in the United States as well, as far as Chicago and so on. Um, it's an innovative method involving uh, educating global citizens, which he discusses in detail in this wonderful book, Raising Global IQ. Um, uh, I first came in contact with Carl Hobart in, uh, through his nonprofit, Axis of Hope, which teaches conflict resolution skills um, to K through 12 students through this very innovative method. He's with us today to discuss that method and its potential. He's also here at Stony Brook helping us consult on our up and coming global studies curriculum. So please uh, join me in welcoming today, Carl Hobart. Thank you, Richard. I appreciate the kind introduction. It's great to be in town. Uh, the uh, first thing I've got to tell you is I'm feeling like I'm in the town of other sports teams. So I come out of Boston where it's the Celtics, it's the Bruins, it's the New England Patriots. And one joke I heard in the hotel today, do you eat Fritos, Doritos, or up in Boston, cheat? That's a Midwest humor joke for cheating up there in the Boston area. <laughs> Tom Brady, the football, deflate gate. We at Boston University argue about that constantly. Who was right, who was wrong? They look at Tom Brady saying he did cheat with those footballs. You look at Bill Belichick, our head coach, who cheated years ago in terms of spy game. So let's just say Boston and Boston University now in terms of those teams have kind of a bad reputation. So when I go to other places and people see me with my Boston Red Sox cap, on my New England Patriots cap, I hear a lot about it. Appreciate being here right now. I saw the New York Yankees cap as I was walking around the so I didn't say anything about it. That's our arch rival team, obviously. But it's great to be in town. Thank you all for coming. So I'd like to start today with an idea. You've got cards in front of you. I'd like everyone, if you would, to please write a triangle on the card. And as you work with that triangle today, you're going to be thinking about conflict resolution and authoring your own new case study on conflict resolution. And I'm going to outline one that I've authored today. And in that triangle, would you please put two overlapping circles at one point in the triangle, and then do the same thing at another point in the triangle, and the third point in the triangle. So two overlapping circles. And what you're going to be doing when you're creating a case study, is thinking about six different parties or groups that could take part in this case study. A case study on some conflict in your area of expertise. And then if you could take three lines, and from the different points in the triangle, please take those lines and put them toward the center of the triangle to make three smaller triangles inside. This is what we're going to be focusing on today. And as I often love to say, if you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. And in terms of the case study approach to conflict resolution and what you're going to be working on today, things will change. May we first, as a quick question, ask people in terms of global mindset and global IQ to stand up if you speak one language fluently. And that includes English. Would everyone stand up, please? Would you please stay standing if you speak at least two languages with native fluency? Native fluency. Three languages? Nepalese, from Nepal, English, Hindi, Spanish, 
Okay, well one of the important things, thank you very much, for seeing who could stay standing with more than one language, many of those people today are from foreign countries. So one of the things to think about in terms of looking at education and raising global IQ is the importance of foreign language acquisition, number one. And number two, what we're dealing with today, the importance of the case study approach to conflict resolution when you're looking at issues around the world. And the one I'm gonna focus on today is the Middle East. My case study in the Middle East is called, Who's Jerusalem? And when I'm teaching students about this, I say to them, before we begin the role play simulation exercises in Who's Jerusalem, our lives come to an end when we become silent about things that matter. Meaning, you may be placed into a party in the Middle East conflict that you're not comfortable with, but you can't remain silent. You've got to learn to walk in the shoes of other parties you may not agree with. Oh, and by the way, I've told people this around the country, that word silent, if you think about it, in terms of conflict resolution, spelled a different way is listen. Listen and silence are very, very powerful tools in terms of conflict resolution and raising global IQ. And it, so the third way is the word enlist. So listen, silent, and enlist are three ways you're taking your student community and your faculty community here, raising global IQ by, as I'm talking about today, pursuing the case study approach to conflict resolution. And it's also what I call, and this is why I took my nonprofit access of hope to Boston University, it's the intellectual outward bound case study approach to conflict resolution, and it's a form of, or an example of, what I call educational civil disobedience. That man got his doctorate at Boston University. And what I decided to do was take this idea of writing case studies on geopolitical conflicts, kind of like Model UN, and allowing students to help me write those conflict case studies, and then teach them conflict resolution role play simulation, improving their negotiation skills, et cetera. This is what I'll be talking about today. So let's take a look at the Middle East. It's our focus. Imagine teaching students about the Arab-Israeli case study, or the Arab-Israeli conflict. The first question many colleagues at Boston University and around the country will say is, well, Carl, how far back do you go in history of this conflict? I look back and I say, well, this is my story, or his story. But maybe, female colleagues, you could write her story. You could write a different case study on this conflict and go back further. It's not a matter of who's telling the right history. It's setting up students who are ready to argue over what's going on in the Middle East today. And you know what I love? Getting criticized for how I wrote the history portion of my case study. Because it's in my eyes. It's in my mind. But being able to take it, look at it, and what I do is I don't put my case studies in PDF format, I send them to anybody for use, open source completely, so you can take it and run with it in your own way, number one, with my particular case studies, and number two, it teaches you how to write your own. And yes, please, no. If you're a risk taker, and you start to write your own case studies on different conflicts that we'll be talking about today, you will get criticized. But you've got to take the criticism. You've got to deal with people who are in correction mode, and say, those people who innovate, those people who are creative, those people who are putting out future leaders, who are going to be effective future leaders, have to take these kind of risks. Feel the fear and do it anyway. That's my case study approach to conflict resolution that I call the intellectual upper bound case study approach. So we move from this, imagine. I say, well, uh, in my normal course, working on the Arab Israeli case study, I go way back to the early 1900s, Sykes to Coke. Then I come up to modern day. What just happened yesterday? Does anyone know what just happened yesterday in the Middle East, in Israel? Well, uh, a man who was killed by the What happened to Justice Tune? Sorry? Justice Tune? 
huge fire. They tried to destroy it. So imagine taking this case study that I've got and constantly updating it from roughly 1900 up to modern day with things that are going on. So any case study you write on some area of expertise, you want to start where you decide to start. And then move up to modern day and continually update and make it available to other people, open source. So here, notice in 1947, I chose this slide for a reason. Post-World War II. Think about the creation of, notice the term, Arab state. Notice the second term. Not Israeli state, but Jewish state. And look at the city I chose for my case study, Jerusalem. What is it called in 1947? An international city. It's not controlled by anyone. It's an international city. Hot topic at the end, who is it that's being controlled? And then you see how you've got Transjordan, you've got Egypt to the north, you've got Lebanon, and to the north and the east, you've got Syria. And you know what's neat about this course that I teach called Educating Global Citizens? Most of my students have no idea about the geography of the Middle East coming in. So to be able to show them slides like this, show them the history of the conflict as it's starting to brew in this part of the world, it's interesting, they're going, wow, I never realized that this started to happen after World War II. Students also don't realize that it was like TJ, Max, and Marshalls in terms of arms that were being used in this part of the world coming out of World War II that the five winners of World War II, the five permanent members of the UN Security Council had and were able to give to a lot of these people in this part of the world to use against each other. China, France, Great Britain, Russia, the United States. These were being used in this conflict. In 1947 again, Jewish state, Arab state created, and then you shock the students with a slide like this. Look what happened at the end of fighting in 1949. And some of my colleagues at Boston University, experts in the Arab-Israeli conflict will say, but you should be filling in more of the gaps there. The point is, I'm getting them ready to argue over this conflict today. I'm giving them the historical background the way I choose to. If you look at 1949 and the end of fighting, look what's created. The state of Israel. And when they compare it to that 1947 map, think about the difference. They're shocked. Wow, did they use their arms? Did they use the numbers? They were here, they were here, they were here has power to create this state, coming out of, many of them, concentration camps. And you see the formation of the Israeli state. You see Gaza, controlled by the Jordanians. You also see the West Bank. Sometimes I say it's kind of like looking at Richard Nixon from the side. See the West Bank in the mouth of Jerusalem? And the little nose there, but it's supposed to be a joke. So you see the West Bank. You see Hebron, you see now, you see Jerusalem. Are these areas here sites of Palestinian refugee camps at this point? No. Anyone? No. Sorry? This point, no. Not at this point. All right? You see what's been taken over by the Jordanians in the West Bank and by the Egyptians in the Gaza Strip with the creation of the State of Israel. And then imagine moving students from this point up to 1967 and the Six Day War. What happens then? You can see Israel moving in over six days into the Sinai Peninsula, the Gaza Strip, into the West Bank, into the Golan Heights. They're there. Will they ever leave? Well, you've got to build a road structure similar to the interstate highway system in the United States. Israel. You've got to set up places for Israeli soldiers to live. You've got to set up different sites in all of these areas so that you can keep Israelis there to protect the state of Israel. And one of the questions I throw out to students is, was this, from the Israeli point of view, invasive? Was this their offensive? Was this the ability to expand their land, or was it defending themselves 
against a possible invasion. I'd love an opinion in this room right here. Yes? I definitely think it was a defense. It was a defense. You can tell by the fact that they gave the Sinai back to Egypt when they didn't take up arms against them in the next war. Okay. Why didn't they get back to West Bank and the Gaza Strip? Because Strait? Jordan did not refuse to take up arms against them. They started sending ballistic missiles across the borders. Very good. You've done your homework. Anyone else? Anyone? Anyway, love to hear your opinion. I throw out this question, was it a preemptive strike or a preventive strike? Personally, I would say it was a preventive strike, like you were saying. But imagine my Palestinian friends who say, oh no, it was a preemptive strike to expand land here. But you know what you're doing when you bring that up? As you're talking about the history, you're getting students prepared, like you, to argue. To argue who's right and who's wrong. We move from this slide to a slide like this, which is the Arab-Israeli conflict to this day. And notice how the West Bank was created with a gouge cutting into what very important city. That border was supposed to go straight north-south. Israel thought differently. And Israel looked at the Muslim population there and said, you should be happy with two cities, Mecca and Medina. This is the third most important holy site in the world for you, Gauge. And we're going to take the western part of Jerusalem. So you start to teach students how that gouge, that mouth, created in the West Bank by the Israelis was the western side of Jerusalem. And East Jerusalem became Palestinian territory. Students start to think about what then happened. Security in the West Bank. Look at the road system. Look at the checkpoints. Look at the bank, the West Bank fence that's being completed. Look at the West Bank fence under construction. And you start to say to students, what do you think? Is Israel here to stay in terms of its security checkpoints? Or is Israel actually going to pull back post-1967 and give this piece of land back to the Palestinians, including East Jerusalem? Because one of the things about East Jerusalem right now is it is completely, completely occupied by Israeli security forces. And then you look at this map. Settlements. And you notice settlement expansion in the West Bank. Will Israel ever decide to give all these settlements back and be able to move back into Israel? I guarantee it, being over there Many times, this will not happen. And notice how the word can teach students this before they get into negotiations over the division of Jerusalem. The use of Israeli settlements as a term versus Palestinian refugee camps. Who's the victim here? My students are oh, I never thought about it that way. You want them to think differently about this conflict by just hearing terms like that. How about terrorists versus freedom fighters? Who's right? Aren't they looking for the freedom of the West Bank? And the Gaza Strip and all of Palestine? Or are they really terrorists? And the reason I bring that up is not to evoke anger. It's to start getting students looking differently at this world. Then I throw out words like Al-Qaeda and other Arabic and Hebrew terms. Anyone know what Al-Qaeda means? And Al-Qaeda is taking part in a lot of this work in the Middle East, unfortunately. It means base, camp, roots, foundation. It doesn't mean terrorism. And you start to teach students the importance of not just looking at this conflict in terms of terms like refugee camp and settlements, but in terms of the difference between a word in Hebrew like shalom and in Arabic, salam alaykum. It means the same thing, my friends. The same thing. And they are so close, or so similar in, from a linguistic point of view. So you show them this. And then you show them what's happened in this city, focusing more and more and more on Jerusalem before the debate begins. Look at the 1949 armistice line, the gouge creating 
the division of the city of Jerusalem. And look what happened in 1967. The gouge gets deeper. The gouge moves further to the east. So you're setting up students with the history, not like an Arab-Israeli conflict history course, but getting them ready to negotiate over the peaceful settlement of this city, Jerusalem, and how to divide it effectively. From here, you start to zone in on exactly what exists here already. Look at some of these areas. Settlement planning locations, existing Israeli settlements, Palestinian localities, and they see where the old city actually is located. And again, look at the gouge. Can you see where the old city is in the initial placement of the border? That gouge to the left side of the old city, look what happened in 1967. That gouge went further to the east. And look what the old city came under in terms of Israel control. You move from here to showing them the division of Jerusalem. You've got the Muslim quarter, you've got the Armenian quarter, the Christian quarter, the Muslim quarter. You know, at one point, David Barak, we call him Little Napoleon, we were doing work with him at Camp David, and Barak came and said, tell me what, Yasser Arafat. And this was Clinton, right at the end of his second term. I will split Jerusalem with you. I will keep the Jewish and Armenian quarters. I'll give you the Muslim and Christian quarters, but you know about the holy sites? Temple Mount, for example, Willing Wall. We, as Israelis, keep sovereignty. You, similar to Mecca and Medina, get custodianship. Don't argue, you're getting a lot. Yasser Arafat at Camp David said, Oh, Ehud Barak. You're trying to get re-elected as prime minister. Would you say that to the whole world to show that you're a peacemaker? He did, Ehud Barak did. Ehud Barak's rival, Sharon, was back in the Middle East. And he said, can you believe what my rival in politics has just done? Saying he will divide that city and give half of it to the Palestinians? Sovereignty versus custodianship? That's even worse. So you set students up for this conflict, showing what's happened in this city throughout history. You move from here to photos of the construction of the wall, new settlements being expanded, the Jewish settlements, the Israeli settlements, into East Jerusalem. They're absolutely gorgeous. You show the relationship between our president, somewhat of a cold relationship, and the Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, graduate of MIT in architecture, and the Sloan School of Management at MIT. Boy, is he a good fundraiser when he comes to the United States for the state of Israel. And boy, is he putting pressure on the Republican Party and the Democratic Party to continue to support the state of Israel in these elections. He is a very bright man. He's got a Philadelphia accent, too. The president visiting the Wailing Wall. And this is an interesting move also. You introduce students to the fact that the president has also met with Mahmoud Abbas, or Abu Mazen. Abu Mazen, head of the Fatah party, one Palestinian party. A lot of students think, oh, wait a minute, Palestinians? You know, it's one of the Palestinian, Palestinian liberation organization or it's only Hamas. No, there are other factors. There are other parties, including this man, al Mazen. You also introduce them to the fact that many in Israel think our president is not only pro-Palestinian, but a terrorist. And you also introduce students to what Hamas actually stands for. Now, I'm just giving you a bit of background before I start talking about exactly what the case study is. Imagine in your area of expertise being able to take a case study like this on the Arab Israel conflict. Remember how you have that triangle? Now, similar to what I've done here, I'm going to ask you to fill in those six different circles. 
Imagine at one point in my triangle of this case study, I've got Hamas and Fatah in two of those circles because they have some overlapping interests. Another point in the triangle, I've got Likud and Labor. They've got overlapping interests also. And then there are two outside organizations that are very powerful in the Middle East right now in terms of negotiations, the Arab League and the Quartet. So would you please right now, in thinking about a new case study, come up with six sides, and you'll put each side into one of those circles. Try and react quickly to a case study. Something you would come up with in your particular area of expertise that's a hot button issue. I'll give you about a minute, please. Does anyone have an idea? One particular case study that you would offer with six sides. Yes? Wind farms off the south fork of Long Island. So we have, on, in one, one uh, corner, we have the community and people, the developers, who do not want to see these things because they will low, lower land values. They are up or everything. On the other side, we have the wind and turbine power and the environmentalists because they want to see these things built for their. And, um, light bulb standard power grid in, in Long Island and maybe the New York Department of Energy on the other train. Great. Thank you. Another example? Anyone? Anyway. Take a risk. Yes. So um, I'm thinking of the issue of endangered languages. So there is the, the government and industry that wants people to sort of speak one standard language so everyone can communicate. On the other side, there are the native speakers of minor minority languages that maybe want you know, to have a sense of identity with those languages, and the academics that want to keep them because they're wonderful things. And then on the outside, I can only think of one sort of group for the third uh, point, and that would be perhaps educators that see the benefit of having a standardized language, but also the benefit of allowing children, for example, to grow up with a native language that they have a personal connection with. Excellent. So you're looking at multiple sides here. You're creating those sides in terms of the instructions you're going to give them for the role play. Thank you. Anyone else? Well, I want to let you know I've done work for years in Rwanda. I was going to give my lecture on Rwanda today. And we talked about coming in here and speaking about the Middle East right now, given what's going on and my passion for that part of the world. But imagine this as my, my case study in Rwanda. I do work for President Paul Kagame. I've been working there since the height of the genocide in 1994. I go there and work with Access of Hope, now the Global Literacy Institute. I go over with Paul Farmer, Partners in Health, and Jim Cam in the field of law, who do the medical work. Imagine my case study in Rwanda. You've got Tutsis, who were the minority controlling that country until the height of the genocide, who left like Paul Kagame. You've got Tutsis who survived inside. They don't like Paul Kagame and others. Chickens who left, even though they were children, who are now back controlled. That's two groups. You've got Hutus who left, and they're now back. You've got Hutus who survived. Some of them are still extremists. You've got the US who's there. Like us, like an injection of millions in capital, you've also got China there. Building the interstate road system, building skyscrapers around the capital. So you can take something like that and create a case study focusing on the future of Rwanda. And does anyone know what Paul Kagame said one month ago about his political future? He, in two years, will be done with his second term. 
And according to the Constitution in that country, that's it. He's gone. He has just announced that he's forming a committee in Parliament to inve investigate, excuse me, a third term for the president. That place has exploded. The U.S. State Department has stepped in and said, you are not going to do this. Paul Kagame said, we're almost not built in a day. I am moving forward as a former Tinsi to do this. There is conflict brewing there. That's why I'm heading back very soon. And what I always do after my simulation exercise on the Rwanda conflict is I take my students with me. But before starting over there, we do the role play simulation of all those different sides. They learn the history of the conflict, the chronology of the conflict. They have all of these different terms and people they know in the conflict. They learn terms in Kenya, Rwanda, the language of the country. And then, and this is your key for case study, they connect via live Skype with all the people I work with all over Rwanda to find out exactly what's going on there and how they feel, including Paul Kagame and Jeanette, his wife, the first lady. So they get it sitting in their own classrooms. I do the same thing with the Arab Israeli case study. Role playing different sides, connecting with Palestinian and Israeli youth and leaders I've worked with for years up there, and then getting the students over there. So you know what It's moving away from comfortable curriculum to getting students involved, connecting them with technology, and then getting it out in the field. John Dewey, Montessori, par excellence. And a lot of us fear that because we're in our silos. And we love what we're doing, we've got a passion for it, and we don't want to take risks. To me, it's all about the students. And I believe in my students, so this is the issue. If you go with this case study, you're starting your students not only studying the history and the chronology and the glossary, but then going into the role play exercise where they've got to represent a particular group. So imagine, students raise your hands here. Great. Let's say I force you to be a member of Hamas, the political wing, not the military wing, even though you're not going to be comfortable with it. So you're going to get into the minds of those people. Someone else? Maybe I'll make you a good party member advisor to Prime Minister, even though you might not agree with that. And maybe I'll make you a member of Fata. You guys do have overlapping interests. So you'll study the history, the chronology, the glossary, and then you'll get your confidential instructions, four pages each. And then, when you go into negotiations, let's say, students, you're in a class of 30 students. I have six different round tables set up. So one table would be your Hamas party table. Another table would be Fatah. Another would be Likud Labor Arab League Quartet. I'd say, students, here you go. 15 minutes. You've all read your confidential instructions. At each table, you've got to talk and create a two-minute summary statement that somebody at your table is going to read for everyone. That's negotiation, students. You've got to be able to negotiate over who the spokesperson is going to be, who the secretary is going to be, and how are you going to say it? And you know what I teach you? You can stand up and say it. And as Noam Chomsky has taught us, you can whisper so people listen to you. You can walk around so people have to follow you. You learn strategies of communication to get your word out effectively. But imagine the negotiations that take place when everyone's at that table with the same confidential instructions. How do we bring it down to two minutes? I'll also go like this, students in this Educating Global Citizens course. You've got 15 minutes to go. And then I'll go around and say, do you need more time? And students will freak and go, yes, we do. And I'll say, negotiate with your table. Choose one student per table to come up and negotiate with me. The students will come up and I'll say, now, six sides, six people, negotiate over how much time you need, and then send one representative to me. All the students stand there, and we negotiate back and forth and back and forth over how much more time. You learn to negotiate on your feet. You might say, we need 10 minutes. I say, I'll give you one. You know what most students will do? OK, whatever my professor says. I say, no, oh, come here. 10, one, nine. Let 
Seven. Excellent. Two. Seven. Hmm. Three. Seven. Four. Seven. And what I teach you is, you just read it one time. You get it one time through this negotiation to those groups. Excellent. And you stick them to it. You're looking to stick them to And the other thing I'll do, body language is important. I'll sit in the chair when all the students are there like this. So you can talk among yourselves, and then you can talk down to me as opposed to my saying, sit in the chairs on the table. So you start to teach subtly or not so subtly the importance of body language in the decision-making process, giving you superiority as opposed to me. That gives you more self-confidence to begin the exercise of case study or You then get back to your tables and look what you have to do, students. Go through different rounds of negotiations. How many tables did I say there were? How many groups? Six. I say, in each round of negotiations, you're going to actually go through paired-up scenarios. So you're going to have to figure out how to take your tables and put them together in pairs. Or, Hamas, you might stick your heels in and say, you've got to come over to our table, Fata, in the first round of negotiations. It's all negotiation. So you have three pairs here. This is what we call diplomatic pods. And notice the three issues that you're arguing over. Focusing on Jerusalem, security, sovereignty over the holy, holy sites or not, and settlement expansion into East Jerusalem or not. And if you look at security, and you're arguing over that as three <coughs> pairs that I showed you here, you can't decide on security. There is a term I brought up earlier in the morning called BATNA, Best Alternative to a Negotiated Agreement. Students, move on to the second issue. Time out on that first issue of security. Move on to try and get some form of agreement vis-a-vis -vis sovereignty. If you can't decide on that, move on to settlements. And the other thing I do is I'm always saying how much time do you need. And if you need more time, imagine when you're in pairs, I'll say please choose one person from the pairs, not one person from each of the tables, to come up and negotiate with me. So it's always, always, always negotiation to try and communicate more effectively among yourselves and with me. Look at the different rounds. And here, remember I talked about your case study? You want to be able to create six different sides with overlap, and then the lines toward the middle of the triangle, which are your three issues. And as you saw before, the three most important issues, number one, security, number two, sovereignty over the holy sites, number three, settlements, it's just like a bullseye. In the middle is a small circle, that's security, the larger circle is sovereignty, and the largest circle is settlements. If you can't decide on the bullseye, move on and then revisit. That's back now. And another book, in addition to mine, that I require for this course is Getting to Yes by Roger Fisher, Bill Urey, and Bruce Patton. Harvard Negotiation Project, three of my greatest mentors. You, you learn things like mutual gains, how do you achieve mutual gains when you're in negotiations, how do you separate the people from the problem in any argument you're having, and the list goes on. All of these skills apply not just in geopolitical conflict, they apply in life. And you can apply these in other disciplines as well. Notice how we move from that first round of negotiations into negotiations round two, round three, round four. And then finally, what you've got to do by the end is create a position paper. Sometimes it's 250 words, sometimes it's 1,000 words, depending on how much time I give my students. And the creation of this position paper is like this. I send all the students back after the different rounds of negotiations and pairs. They get it back to their six tables. And I say, our new three pods are no longer going to be three pairs of groups. Each pod is going to be an issue. So there will be one pod, one large table, focusing on security. The second point in the triangle 
The second pod focuses on sovereignty. The third on settlements. The students say, what are you talking about? We're at our individual tables like we were at the beginning of the exercise. And I said, you choose one third of your group to go to the sovereignty table, the settlement table, the security table. You know why? Now you're focused on an issue with six sides there, as opposed to two sides focusing on three issues. And you know what you learn is a mathematical formula, my friends, in conflict resolution. When you walk in as one party versus the other, you walk away with 50% of the blame. And you've got to try and sell it at home, and you could lose a lot. When you are one-sixth at a table, you only get one-sixth of the blame. Think about the mathematical formula. No longer is it three pairs. It is three points. Security, sovereignty, settlement at three tables. Each table has six different sides represented. And what some students will say is, oh, does that mean we send one person from each group to the three tables? No. You send one third of your table or group so that everyone goes. And you know what you're focused on now? Not defense of your party. You're focusing on the issue. And you've got six different ideas at that table. And I give you a time limit, and you've got to come up with this summary or proposal. And I send a copy of every single one of these to old colleague, not dear friend, but friend, who used to be the senator from the state of Massachusetts, John Kerry. Second, U.S. Secretary of Education, who gave me a race to the top funding to write the Who's Jerusalem case study, Marty Young. Third, Barack Obama. Every single position paper written by my students goes to these people. You should see the responses. Students cannot believe it, that they get responses from these people for at least thinking outside the box. And it may not be that these are the answers to all the questions or the solutions to all the problems, but the students have gone through the conflict resolution exercise, being able to look at problems like you look at a crystal ball from all different angles. It is not two-dimensional, this conflict. It is not black and white. It is incredibly complex. And the power of students when they go through this exercise, not once, but several times over the course of the semester, with multiple issues, is absolutely extraordinary. And you move from there, after that agreement phase, to what I assign my students after every class. Students, raise your hands again. Imagine you're taking this course, 15 student maximum course. I divide you into teams of three. You don't know each other. You may be from three different countries. You've got to choose your own new conflicts that you're going to write your own new case studies about in teams of three. It could be a global case study. It could be more of a national scientific based case study. It could be a local case study. Brilliant one, wind turbine on Cape Cod, should it exist or not? It's a bloody civil war problem. And you know what I do with you students? Instead of saying, okay, procrastinate until the end of the semester and turn in the 70 to 80 page new case study as a first draft, you have to turn in small portions over the semester, draft after draft, starting with the short proposal, and then a portion of the history section, and then the next assignment is the chronology, the next assignment is the glossary, the next assignment is the six sides, and then we revisit the history to expand that, we revisit chronology, so over the course of the term, you're building this new case study, and you're putting the stamp of your university and your own stamp your name on it, and you're getting published as undergrads through my publishing media press. I've learned a lot from Harvard Business School, case study approach, and getting undergrads who I believe in to be able to partner in teams to build new case studies. And then imagine the three of you, or two groups of three, coming in here to this room at the end of the semester. You've got to present your new case study to the college community. 
and you've got to take questions from the crowd. You invite plenty of your friends and peers who will support you, but I'll also invite faculty members and administrators who will be blown away by the new area of expertise. So you get published as an undergrad. That's educating local citizens, is being able to teach you how to use the case study approach to conflict resolution, and then helping you to develop your own new case studies. And here, several points, several goals. We must strive for maintenance of peace beyond the peace treaty. That's teaching students in the classroom, the whole idea of conflict resolution. High officials are under political pressure not to be flexible and not to generate options that could benefit all sides because they must deal with their own people when they return. One of the things I teach students is when you make a decision in conflict resolution at the negotiating table, you've got to go sell when you get home. Can you imagine Andrew Barak having a candidate of course? He went home, he committed not suicide, but political suicide. He was assassinated politically. So you've got to be careful when you give in to think about what's going to happen when you get home. And look at helping Israelis and their Arab neighbors to learn about and practice working jointly and peacefully on what we what will be an endless stream of differences as a process. No longer can we think we've got to put up a treaty on the wall and stop this process. It is practice, 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 practice for the big game of the summit conference, and then practice, practice, practice. Again, the same thing I do in this educated world of citizens course. Practice, practice, practice for the big game of life in terms of conflict resolution and negotiation. And one of the things I bring up in my book is the whole idea of track one and track two diplomacy to tell students that track one diplomats are leaders, presidents, prime ministers, secretaries of state. They're the ones that get to the table to negotiate and sign agreements. Track two is NGOs and non-governmental organizations. They're out there doing the work more 24-7. Access of hope, partners in help, health, doctors without borders. But I believe that students are track three that's that live third rib. That live third rib can kill. I've seen plenty of youth around the world pick up guns and machetes and kill. You can also be a positive, positive electricity, moving the peace process forward in the future if you learn how to do it in four hundred years. That's the thing about that live third rib. That moves trains forward. It can also kill people. How are we looking at? I believe you. I believe the glass is half full on that live third rail, not half empty. And here, think about diplomacy, not about empathy, but more about respect. And down here, ex Secretary of State Henry Kissinger always said, you've got to be smart, tough, and fair. And finally, Batman, as I said before, your best alternative to a negotiated agreement. You want to be able to figure out what's going on in the minds of people as you're brokering agreements to decide in the end what will and will not work. And I leave you with this quote from my book. You young people should consider yourselves fortunate that you and your impressionable years have the opportunity to exchange viewpoints and ideas with those of a variety of cultural backgrounds. There is no better opportunity to acquire the lifelong insights that are necessary for the resolution of international problems and conflicts in the hope that your endeavors have a lasting impact. I send you my warmest greetings and wishes. That was Albert Einstein, Salzburg, Austria. He believed in you. He also felt guilty about what he did in so many positive ways, nuclear energy. How about what he did in negative ways? What was his major real complex? Wow, we could blow up the world. He believed in youth, and he often would think about and take quotes from somebody he admired in history as well. He said, there was a man I admired in history who actually made a fortune in the construction industry around the world. Buildings, road systems, oh, 
He and his people invented dynamite. And he'd chuckle and say, and he never got married, and his girlfriend was sitting there next to him when he was on his deathbed. And she said to him, knowing he had all this money in his bank account, honey, when you die, are you going to feel good about the money you made because of construction or destruction? This is the month of October. You know who that was? Nobel. Nobel. Okay? And I so believe in students, and I so believe in the fact that the college community can come together and say, no longer do we have to think, we have to get faculty members who are going to win Nobel. Don't get me wrong, it's a great idea. But my belief is, I want to be able to walk down the aisle in either Oslo or Stockholm someday as an old man with a hearing aid and be able to see a former student win a Nobel. You know you have planted the seeds in a student to go on to greatness, benefiting other people. Seriously, I know that. So I ask people in those cards that you've got to please think about the case study approach to conflict resolution, the creation of six sides, the taking the three bulleted ideas in the middle, and figure out what you can do to come up with a new case study. And if you want to email me at Boston University with your proposal, I could run with it and decide exactly how I could help you uh, continue to author that. So please let me know. And I'd like to now open it up to questions from people. You can see I'm very passionate about this. And I could go on and on and on. Anyway. And again, I go to college campuses and talk about this. Boy, I have been chewed up and spit up by people who do not want to move along a different path. This is what we do. This is what we do well. And we're going to get in correction mode, and we're going to tell you we can't do this. You should see what happens to students when they do this. That's what I believe in planning for seats. So please, whatever you want to let fly, I'm used to it. As is my mentor and his mentor, Noam Chomsky. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, you talked about conflict resolution models, and you presented alternative models. Um, have you sort of brought into the classroom conflict resolution models that, that come from the culture um, so that the framework with which we do things differently are not all ours, all local, but the Models and strategies and frameworks and terminologies that are coming. You, you brought up terminologies, but I was wondering in terms of frameworks and models and approaches, if you have drawn from other cultures far away here, nearby, or not somewhere else. Definitely. I mean, one of the things you want to look at is you want to know where you are and with whom you're dealing before you get there and become, and you've got to teach students this, how to become a chameleon how to fit into a culture and a language effectively. So it's very complex in terms of going into different societies with different case studies and understanding every place that's outside of my expertise. One thing I can tell you is, and this is a Jimmy Carter trick, wherever you go around the world, you develop a little bit of a knowledge of the language and the culture, and you come with gifts that are going to be appreciated. Not a Dunkin' Donuts card, for example, gift card. And you'll be able to come in there and not only and, and work with students on a conflict or a case study that exists elsewhere in the world after showing them that you appreciate being in their country, being able to provide their culture and linguistic rules. But I have to be careful about spreading myself too thinly and thinking I'm an expert in all these different parts of the world. That's why the protege approach is important. Imagine you being able to take this back to a place you know very well being able to filter these ideas and say, would you help me take it to a place where I can build that bridge back to that country? And then I would teach you how to take a case study on something else into an area of conflict that you understand. That's what I call spokes of bicycle. Mm -hmm. Being in the middle, having protégés, protégé, you know, the word in French, protected, but also believed in and getting out there and doing this work. Where you can take the ideas and want to support you. 
that's that idea. Understanding the curriculum and being able to take it and, and return it to a place that you really understand what to do. And be a chameleon. Really be able to change. Yes? But as a follow up, take the negotiation you did on time um, with the student to my right. Is that going to work with Asian students? Are they going to sit there and go, no, no, seven, 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 seven? <laughs> going well, what's not going well, 
I could ask a question like that. And not only do I get the responses from the students from China, for example, I would get a response from you about those students from China, what would I have other possibilities? I am a perfectionist, and I am so passionate about what I'm doing. Back to your point, it's definitely not lecture mode. It's definitely not memorizing or regurgitating my material. It's going from first person singular I to first person plural we. Play the game, if you will. You approach this as a team. And you continually update and improve your materials by getting students in the Okay? Yes? Um, wonderful lecture. I, I, I was curious to know if there are some solutions that your students have come up with that you think are particularly uh, creative, wonderful, something that you can share about that. And if there are some solutions that, that might keep repeating. If you as an institution want to receive a multi-million dollar grant from the United States government, it would be through the intelligence community. It would be from the Central Intelligence Agency, National Security Agency, we've talked about this before, Homeland Security. Students have been able to identify the fact that there are so many students who are very smart about what's going on in the world and problem solving around the world who are right here because they experience it all the time in their own countries. They bring it here, and they're going back on a regular basis as well. So just one thing, what I've learned from students is, hey, come on in during office hours. There are crises going on in Syria, for example. You should see the students that are coming, Iranian students coming in. I learned so much from them about what's going on and how to potentially solve problems because they figure out ways to stay in touch with students that nobody else can, meaning youth. Back in countries. So I think that sort of connection, being able to use your international student population to talk about problems that exist, to get the real story or the whole story from those students, and to sit down in the chair beside you and go, what would you do in this particular situation? It's amazing what they can come up with. So I think that's one of the biggest things I've found. For example, having an Israeli a Syrian and an Iranian student in my office talking about what's going on in the Middle East right now. Iran has decided to bury its two nuclear sites because Iraq, years ago, put its site above the ground, and F-15A came in from Israel and blew the whole thing to sides. So those two sites are on the ground right now, talking to the Iranian student, the Syrian student, and the Israeli student about bringing in a dirty bomb from Iran into Syria and then into Israel, or launchability from Iran into the middle of Jerusalem, it exists right now. That is one of Netanyahu's big nightmares. And I'm talking to them and saying, okay, so what do we do? How do we prevent this? So these are the issues that come up, these modern day issues, and getting students to come in and talk and say, hey, this is the way to keep negotiations going between countries as opposed to building up military. Yes? I can see that in your office, the, the situation, and I can see it in my office. Uh, and I must say, I mean, I, I very much like your approach, and I think the seed that you talked about is, uh, is very important. So if all people in the world would approach conflict with conflict resolution mindset, then maybe there would be resolution. But I would like to know that you say a little bit more about conflicts that have not found the resolution. I mean, the conflict you described is a brewing conflict without a resolution. Uh, the Democrats and Republicans in this country are a conflict without resolution. So what, what, what does your approach do when you meet intransigent parties? Think about it, if you've ever had a family member or a friend with cancer. I run in Boston Marathon every year for Dana Farber Cancer Institute to raise money for kids with cancer. You've got people with cancer who are dying of cancer and people with cancer who have it in remission. There is a cancer conflict in the Middle East that is in remission right now. It is never going away. So do we look upon that as a failure? Do we leave it alone? Or do we, as I often say, confront conflict 
head-on with a different type of chemotherapy in the classroom. We have to. So there are we can't just look at things as we've solved these problems. We have to keep teaching students that there are problems we're not going to solve, but that doesn't mean that you just say we failed, we've got to move on. Again, it's not black and white, two-dimensional. It's thinking about things differently in a, in a way where we, we always try and think about, okay, how can we work to improve the situation as opposed to just you know, shunning? And I often use that word cancer because we do have cancer conflict going on in the world. And I believe in the prevention of cancer, the cancer conflict, through what I call the vitamin C's of conflict prevention. Communication, comprehension, compromise, compassion, coexistence, creativity, the list goes on the race beginning to see. So again, there are issues that are never going away. We cannot stop confronting them. And we have to allow students to think creatively about how to confront those because when we're doing that, we lead them to looking at other problems in many different ways. And I talked about global case studies, national case studies, and local case studies. Think about what this does personally, too. You know, in terms of looking at yourself differently. I mean, that was one question that came up in an earlier meeting today. What about the inside of the person? And just the ability to be able to listen more. The ability to be able to think outside the box and more creative. The ability not to, instead of ready, fire, aim, People are often in the mode of ready and fire. Teaching students to think differently about how to confront problems by aiming. And also studying perhaps then successful negotiations in the real world. I mean, the environment where the deal is such a case, basically, right? right? And then you can learn probably also something what you had to exclude and include and so on and so forth. So I think. The empirical study also of such negotiations would very well be part of that approach. And the other important thing is having a course like this, educating global citizens, and as I said, collaborating with other colleagues and other departments, other disciplines, to be able to bring in ideas like the one you've got, as opposed to saying this is all that's going to be done. Okay? Yes? How do you get over fundamental, illogical, problems that you can't just negotiate away. Like if you talk about the uh, Israel example in Jerusalem, you can't logically say you get one city, you get a different city because so many people have such a deep-rooted religious investment in Jerusalem. There, nobody is ever going to give that up. Or if you're talking about clean energy on Cape Cod, there are people that just don't believe in global warming, so they're not going to conform to the ideals that of negotiation. They're not going to you know, move a little towards the middle to make a, a solution because they don't see a need for a solution. So how do you get past something like that that you really just can't get past? Could you play the role of Hamas, do you think? I think I would have to learn a lot more about Hamas's side and I would still have deep-rooted problems with it. I think that I could do it at a mock negotiation table. I do not think I could do it at the UN. Well. Imagine a good athlete, and I often compare it to this. Tom Brady is our quarterback in New England. Tom Brady, as well as other great quarterbacks, break down films of the defenses of the teams that are going to be taking on the following week. They get into the brains of every single person on the defense, even though they may. This is the idea here. Not that you've got to change your view, but you've got to be able to walk in the shoes of everyone at the negotiation table figure out what's going on in those brains before you get to the table. That creates more success for you as a negotiator, even though you're very pro as you're really whatever. That's the whole idea. It's teaching you different strategies for communication, compromise, et cetera, but especially negotiation and conflict resolution. Okay? Remember to listen spell and not always silent? You've got two ears and one mouth, you should listen twice as much as you speak. Okay? As opposed to always letting it fly. And you learn those skills. Pretty amazing what happens. Remember, I talked about body language. Instead of saying, This is what you're going to do, I'll come up to you and I'll say, What would you think if we were to do this together? I empower you by asking you a question. I use me, I use wood, the condition. So you get a stake in the decision making process. It's all part of, again, learning negotiations, getting 
away from trying to brainwash it into another way of thinking. I respect what you think. It's just getting used to a different problems. Anyone else? Yes? Yeah, I should have a great question. Yes. That we've actually done as an experiment was a great idea. Instead of just having their one particular position that they've got to defend, finally being able to be other ones, yes. And it does work well if you've got the time. What I do with my semester long course is we study four different case studies over the course of the term, so you've got one every two weeks. A little bit difficult to go that deeply into it, but what Boston University has said is would you teach it as a year long course so you can do exactly that? So you understand that, that is a better way of seeing all sides before you find the right out of your position. Yeah, I think that's going to have the opinion to ask if you need to end the other side of that. Because that shows that you have a full understanding of both sides of your Right. Yeah, there is one model where you can take the same case study and those different small groups have to play every single side in the negotiations. Right. So that is another possibility, again, that's the extent. If you had to offer a case study of a small group, what would be? Students who are in here, when you're studying the Arab Israeli conflict from the point of view of the media, where would you first go online as a media source to read about what just happened at right. Joseph's tomb? New York Times. The New York Times. Can you imagine, when I'm using this case study, teaching the importance of media literacy, how is one particular incident in the Middle East covered by? CNN, New York Times, Fox News, BBC, Al Jazeera, Jerusalem Post. Who's telling the truth? Sorry? No. All of them. All of them. And remember, the, the, think about the term history. That is his story. And I say, why don't we call it her story? No. Why don't we all say his story? And that is. Yeah, that's interpretation of events. 
So being able to teach you students how to, again, look at things differently. And one of the things I also teach is take criticism as a compliment. I have had a smear campaign against me by a man named Charles Jacobs in the Boston area. Very pro-Israeli man. Americans for Peace and Tolerance is one of five nonprofits that he's got. He created a 27 minute documentary about me that cost him probably 25 to $30,000. Our dear friend Noam Chomsky said Carl Tate was gone. It was a total smear campaign, and I could have sued him. I didn't. In that 27 minute documentary, he said, Look what he is doing to brainwash students. We get them to become members of Hamas. I mean, he looked at this and he exploded. You know why? He's got five nonprofits. He gets other very pro Israeli people to contribute money to his nonprofits and get tax write offs for that. So he can, number one, create new documentaries about people, and number two, legally contribute to political campaigns. And look what we're going through right now. We're going through elections, and this is completely legal. These are nonprofits and they're political action committees. So people say, well, he has the right to do that. So do I. This is uh, freedom of speech. And again, you can see how much I believe in this. And it happens. And back to John Speedy, he said, take this Thank you for coming. I really appreciate it.